All right, let's look in God's Word. Stand up with me in honor of reading God's Word. Matthew 28, verse number 1. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene, let me just comment, the one of which was Jesus cast out seven demons from her. She fell in love with that man who gave her peace. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven. Did y'all hear that? God sent an angel. Angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. I mean, isn't that cool? He just rolled it back and just sat down and wanted to have a front row seat at what was about to happen. And it says his countenance was like lightning. This bright shining. It is more... Uh, it is the glory of God. When we get to heaven, we know that there will be no more sun, there will be no more moon. We will not need any artificial light because the glory of God will be there. And literally, this angel who had just come from the very presence and the glory of God, it was just shining all over him. And he's just sitting there on that stone looking like lightning. I like that. I think that's cool. His clothing was as white as snow. And the guards, the one who were sent there to guard the tomb, shook for fear of him and became like dead men. I don't know if that just means they passed out or what, but they're just, they're like dead people there. Verse number five. And the angel answered and said to the women, do not be afraid. I kind of think it's humorous. The guards, they faint pass out, but these two women, they're just still sitting there just taking it all in. Do not be afraid for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. That's true. He is not here. That's true. For He is risen. That is true. As He said, come and see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell His disciples that He is risen from the dead. And indeed, He is going before you in a Galilee. There you will see Him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word. Verse 9. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice. They had just cried their eyes out for two days. They probably didn't sleep much that night, waiting for the Passover to be over, the first day of the week where they could come and hopefully anoint Jesus' dead body. But when they met him, he said to them, the words they needed to hear, rejoice. Uh, all that other stuff's got to go. It's time to rejoice. So they came and held him by his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee. And there they will see me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we love you. We thank you. We bless you. And Lord, today is the day that you, we celebrate when you uh, came back from the tomb. You had given your life on the cross, and now you're taking that life back so that we could have eternal life with you. Father, receive our worship today. Father, uh, all is vain if I speak. But Lord, all is blessed and glorious and wonderful if you speak. So Lord, from your heart to our heart, Speak your truth from your word. Draw us close to it. Let us not leave the same. Father, being changed by being in the presence of your glory. Help us, Lord, today to worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The preceding week, the preceding Sunday, had begun with great praise. Great praise. But it ended in great rejection. He came to proclaim truth to the people. But they rejected the truth because what they wanted was something that was a convenient truth for them. They didn't want what the truth was. They were just looking for somebody to say something to make them feel good. A lot of churches do that today. 
They really don't want to tell you the truth. They want to tell you something that is a, a convenient truth for you to hear. Something that we don't really like to be challenged by faith, to walk in faith. We really want something just to give us the, the good feelings in our, in, our, in our human flesh, so to speak. But Jesus came to give them truth. He came to, to, to help people. He came to set the captives free. So whenever he found someone in need, he met the need. When he found a person that was a leper, he was willing to reach down and touch them. The one thing that nobody else was willing to do. When he was walking down the street and he heard a blind man say, Blessed son of David, have mercy on me. That stopped him in his tracks because he came to give sight to the blind. When some friends brought a, a lame man who could not walk, put him on a, a mat with two sticks and took him to the house where Jesus was and he could not get into the house because there were so many people. They just walked up on the roof, just kicked a hole in the roof and just lay, lowered him down. Don't you know Jesus was smiling when he saw that? What did he do? He told the man who was lame, rise up, take up your bed and walk out of this place. And by the way, your sins are forgiven you. He went to a to, to church and there was somebody who had a withered hand so he told him to stretch out his hand and he was healed and they got mad at him because he healed someone on the sabbath day he came to proclaim truth but all really people wanted was someone just to amen what they already thought not challenge them to to grow closer to god just simply that they're okay right the way they are he came to help. They didn't want to hear that. So the chief people, the ones who should have known the most and the best, they took him, put him on trial, tried some trumped up charge. They couldn't find one. So they finally asked him the question, are you the Christ? Well, he had to tell the truth, amen? Amen. So he told them, yes, I am. By the way, the next time you see me, I'll be coming with power in the clouds. They didn't like that at all. They tore their robes off and said, blasphemy. This one acts as if he was God. It would be blasphemy, but the thing was, he was God. But they weren't willing to receive that. So they took him to Pilate so that Pilate could put him to death. Even Pilate said, why? What has this man done? I find no fault in him. A Roman officer of the court of the day said, I find no fault, but yet they shouted louder, crucify him, crucify him. And after they had mocked him, scorned him, spit into his face, cursed him, pulled out his beard, put that crown of thorns on him, took the, the rods and beat him, took the cat of nine tails and whipped him 39 lashes. Then he carried his cross as best he could out of the city, down the hill, back up to a, a, a roadside, a hill called the place of the skull, Golgotha. You may know it as Calvary. And they drove spikes into his hands and into his feet. And there he hung between heaven and earth, crucified. Not because he had done anything wrong, but because I had done wrong. Not because he had ever sinned, but because I needed a Savior to cleanse me of my sin. And he said, Father, forgive them. And at the end, he breathed, breathed his last. He shouted, Unto Thy hands I commend my spirit. And he bowed his head. They could not take his life, but he gave his life. A ransom for me. Joseph of Arimathea went to Pilate and asked for the body. He said, how quickly he's died. Yes, you can have the body. And they took him, Joseph and Nicodemus, and they quickly wrapped him in cloth and put him in a tomb where no one had been laid before. And sealed it 
with a rock because Passover was coming. And they wanted to be ceremonially clean. Satan thought he had won. His creator God, the one he knew was in heaven, had come to earth. Satan had tried to trip him up along the way. Satan had tried to get him to sin in some way. But now he had him right where he wanted him. Dead. They thought it was a period at the end of the sentence. Jesus is gone. Satan thought he would rule now. And they put him in that borrowed tomb. And the next day, Passover, the Sabbath. And the chief priest went to the temple, went to the synagogue, had all of his priestly robes on, looking fine, looking good, with a smile on his face because that thorn in his side, Jesus, had been killed, murdered, crucified. And he was happy about it. And he went as the chief priest was to do, to take the blood of the sacrifice into the inner temple. And there where the curtain was to separate man from the Ark of the Covenant, the Holy of Holies. But now he goes in and sees the veil there torn in two from the top to the bottom. Because when Jesus died, he said there is no barrier any longer between man and God. And there needs to be no more sacrifice because he had been the sacrifice. The priest went in with the blood to, to temporarily, symbolically cover the sins of Israel for a year. But Jesus had already covered it for all time. The head church. Cold, going through the motions, church. I'd rather do anything than go to some place where all we do is stand up when we're supposed to, sit down when we're supposed to, sing when we're supposed to, give when we're supposed to, and praise God, go home when we can. You can call that many things, but I don't call that church. But they came, but the Lord didn't come. They went through all the motions. God wasn't there. May it never be when we gather together as God's redemptive children, uh, uh, the glory of His majesty, the, the jewel of His crown, that we come without bowing before the King of kings and Lord of lords. I don't want to ever go to church without Jesus. Amen? Amen. I mean, we may be ceremonially right, but we're wrong as wrong can be. Oh, how blessed it is when you come with God's people and you feel the Spirit of the God move among His people and you feel the warmth of His embrace and those glory bumps begin to roll. You come in to sit quiet, but the next thing you know, an amen will come from your lips that you didn't even plan or want. Just God shouting out from your soul. A dead Sabbath. Can I say it again? A dead Sabbath. They knew better. They just wanted their own way. Oh, but the next morning, everything changed. Mary and the other Mary got up early, ran to the tomb. Or I don't know if they ran to the tomb. They went early in the morning. And when they got there, there that angel was just as proud as he could be, sitting up on the rock smiling at him. Why are y'all here? I know why you're here. You came to see Jesus, who was crucified, who was dead, but he's not dead any longer. Look where they laid him. The grave clothes are in there. I heard a preacher say one time, they were all put in order because Mary, when he was a little child, told him to make up his bed. I don't know if that's true or not. But they looked in and they saw the grave clothes there and they saw nobody else was there. And he said, go tell his disciples he's alive. 
And as they were leaving, they saw Jesus and fell at his feet. And his words were to him what his words are to us. Rejoice. I don't know what your intentions were when you came to this place, but what God wants you to do while you're in this place is rejoice because we serve a risen Savior. And He's in this world today. And I know, oh my goodness, you're going to get me singing here. I can't do that. I want you to know there's a new day. And it's a wonderful day. Look, look in verse number 5 here. The angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen as He said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell His disciples that He is risen from the dead. And indeed, He is going before you into Galilee. There you will see Him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with great with fear and great joy and ran to bring His disciples' word. Listen to me now. 66 words. That's all. But 54 of those words were one syllable. The Gospel's not complicated. It's as simple that I've seen a six-year-old child come to know the Lord. A hard-headed ten-year-old boy walked an aisle and met heaven. I want you to know that we make things complicated and hard that Jesus never did. He never did. So how is the proof? Where's the proof that Jesus is alive? Can I give y'all seven quick reasons? Number one, Jesus was crucified publicly. There's no doubt He was dead. He was on a road right there just outside of Jerusalem. Over 100,000 pilgrims had come to the city that week. All the ones who were in the sounding, uh, resounding its surrounding areas were there. And He was publicly lifted up on that cross for all to see Him. All people from all over the world, no one debates this very fact. Jesus was crucified and died on the cross. Some said He was just swooning. That he just, uh, some liberal said he, he, he had just passed out. He was in that grave three days. He was dead. I heard an old preacher one time called him, called him graveside dead. That's dead. Graveyard dead. Well, there he was. There he was. Number one, he died publicly. Number two, his disciples saw the risen Lord. But let's not stop there. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that others saw him alive as well. At one time it said over 500 people saw him alive. And then Paul adds this word, of which most of them are still alive today. You know what we call that? An eyewitness. If you, have, if you go to court today and, and you, you're being tried for something and they bring a witness before you, I mean, that's how we try cases. That's how we know something is true. Is you can ask them the questions and they can testify. How good of a case would you have if you had over 500 eyewitnesses that saw Him alive? And by the way, they weren't all just disciples and followers. Some of them were unbelievers who saw Him, who knew Him well. Number three, they preached the good news like Jesus told them immediately. It wasn't something they decided to do later. They just went and told everybody what they did. And you know what they told them? Peter got up on Pentecost and he preached the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave. Read all the way through the book of Acts and it'll tell you the great works of, all, of, of God. But he would always say, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know what this sermon is today? It's a sermon on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. All the other religions of the world are based on dead gods. Just one where He is alive today. Amen? We serve a risen Savior at the right hand of God. Listening to our prayers. Joining us in our worship. Who prayed for me before I woke up this morning? And who will hold me when I go to sleep tonight? We have a God who's alive and active in your everyday circumstances. We have a God. Number four, 
Everything changed. Everything changed because of the resurrection. The whole world was changed. 3,000 people got saved that day. And people started getting saved every day. And they went everywhere telling the gospel. Have y'all ever, you know what BC, you know, time BC, AD? You know what BC stands for? AD stands for? After Domenio, after his, after his birth. Everything is, even time is based on our Lord. You can't get all the governments of the world to come together on something, but Jesus can. We're going to look to Him. Everything in the world has changed. You know why the worst people in the world, when they want to say the worst curse words, you know what they say? His name. Even when they're trying to dishonor, they're still using the name of Jesus. Philippians 2, the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess. Those in heaven, those in earth, and those under the earth. Let me talk about that a little bit. In Luke chapter 16, it says that a, a story of a man by the name of Lazarus, who was a beggar, and a rich man who had all the things that this world has to offer. One had nothing, one had everything. And they both died. One opened his eyes in what is called Abraham's bosom. The other opened his eyes in hell. Sheol, Hades, the grave. Now, if you're a believer in God... If you believe in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, when you die, you immediately go to what is called heaven, the place where God is right now. By the way, that's not the last place. Revelation 21 says there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. If you're looking for the streets of gold, that comes later. But right now, there's the throne room of God where Jesus is right now. You get to be with Him. But if you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, you go to a place that is called hell. That's where the rich man went and said he was tormented. And between, he could, he could look beyond what was called a great chasm and he could see those in what was called Abraham's bosom. And he said, could you get somebody to bring me just a, a drop of cold water to put on my tongue? But he said, no, because no one can go between the two. Whichever side of that chasm you're on, Please hear me. That's the side of the chasm you stay. One had everything that this world has to offer, but there they had nothing that God had to offer. The one down here had nothing that this world offers, but he was in the very presence, and he was a child of God in his heaven. Can I say one made a bad trade? One made a very wise, wise choice. It says in 1 Peter 3 that when Jesus was died and He was placed in the tomb, He went to the grave to preach to the prisoners who were there. Philippians 2, every name shall confess Him to those in heaven and those in earth and those under the earth. Everybody will have to confess Jesus is Lord. It's just going to be too late for some. Let me tell you a fifth reason why I know that he, there is, that he is the, the proof of the resurrection. Look in your Bible in Matthew 28, verse 11. Now they, while they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priest all the things that had happened. You remember those, those, those policemen there that were, that were supposed to be guarding it that passed out? When they woke up, they went back to the city. They went to the chief priest and they told them all the things that had happened. They knew what happened and they testified to it. Verse 12, when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers saying, here's your story. Tell them his disciples came at night and stowed him away while we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. They had to make him secure because you see, if you were guarding someone and you couldn't do it, they would kill you. 
So he says, we'll take care of it for you. Verse 15. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. Here's the most important. Here's the money part. This saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. It was commonly known that they were bought off. I mean, here's the testimony. Even those people were testifying that Jesus was resurrected. The angel descended, rolled the stone away, sat on it, and testified that the one inside was no longer there. When you can get the ones whose life would be killed if they told the story, when you can get them to tell the story, you've done something. Number six, James, his half-brother. His brother... With Mary, yes, with Joseph. Joseph was not Jesus' dad. He never was a believer until he saw the resurrected Christ. Never believed in Jesus as the Messiah or the Christ until he saw that he had rose from the grave. And then number seven, Paul. The zealot who persecuted the church. Matter of fact, he was going to Damascus to get some more of those Christians and round them up so that they could be tried and killed. But he met the Lord along the way. And God changed that man. He became a preacher of the gospel, wrote half the New Testament, gave his life willingly, beheaded in Rome because of the gospel. Willingly, all of the disciples became martyrs because they serve a risen Lord. They weren't afraid to die because one had made had already come back to life. So who are we? We were defeated. But Jesus brought us victory. We were down. But Jesus came to lift us up. We were in sin. But Jesus came to be our Savior. We face death, but He came to give us life. We had no hope, but He made a better way. Let me say one last thing to you. Let me read to you what God's Word says in Revelation 21. Let me tell you what Jesus is going to do for us. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth have passed away. Why? Because there's sin in this earth. And there were people who sinned in God's heaven. And it had to go because God made a place for us where sin had never been, would never be. Then verse 2, he said, I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, Adorned for her husband. I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he, that is Jesus, will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Are you listening to me? God will wipe away every tear from their eye. You ever had tears? No more. There will be no more death. No more sorrow. Could you imagine? No more sorrow. No more crying. There shall be no more pain. For the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Right, for these words are true and faithful. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the waters of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. I will be his God. He shall be my son. But I can't say all that without giving you the last words. He says, but the cowardly. Those who looked at it, but... Too big of a coward to step up into truth. The cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, 
idolaters, all liars, shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You know what I'm telling you? He came that we may have life and that we may have it abundantly. But if you want to go to heaven, you're going to have to go by the way of the cross. You're going to have to pass by the empty tomb. And you're going to have to call upon the living Savior. He's the only one who paid the sacrifice. He is the only way. He is the only truth. He is the only life. No man comes to the Father but by Him. You want to hold on to your way? That's all you're going to have. You'll be like the rich man who had all the blessings of this world. By goodness, how blessed we are. But you'll be bankrupt throughout all of eternity. But if you're wise enough to come and cry out to the one who can make it whole, and I pray that you're listening to the Holy Spirit of God speaking to your heart right now. You will confess your sins. You will tell Him you believe in Him. And you will ask Him to do for you what only He can do. He will save you. He will forgive you. You will be His forevermore. There is a better way. There is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. But I'm here to tell you, there is no other name given among heaven by which we must be saved. Just the name of Jesus. Say it again. Jesus. It's your choice. Jesus has done it all. It's up to you. You receive the free gift of life or you reject Jesus and you spend your eternity without Him. There is no greater question. There is no greater victory. Psalms 30 says this. Morning will last for a night. Crying, weeping, weeping will last for a night. But joy comes in the morning. Because we serve a risen Savior, there's new hope. There's life in Him. He goes on to say, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. You find it in Christ, in Christ alone. But just let me remind you, it's your choice. But if you heard my voice today, and the Spirit has been speaking to your heart, I can't make that choice for you. You've got to make it for yourself. 